I'm sure we've all traveled. Garrett, have you ever driven anywhere, you and Kaylee? Nowhere. Uh, but I'm sure we've all driven to Columbus. We've all driven to Cincinnati. So what do we see while we're on the way? We see signs, indicators of how close or how far we are to the city you know, in comparison to where we are. So a lot of times when, as we get closer, those signs get bigger. Sometimes they span across the highway and sometimes they're just bigger, you know, alongside of it. But on the way, those are indicators. You know, when we actually get to the city, then they're on big display. So if most of us, if we pay attention, and Brother Wayne kind of goes along with your testimony, if we're paying attention to the signs, we're getting pretty close to the city. It's getting pretty clear with those indicators that where we're going is not too far off. I had a couple examples here. You know, the signs and prediction of the return of Israel, the signs that the Middle East would be in turmoil, the signs that Persia, which is Iran, and Babylon, which is Iraq, would be the center of attention. And this one I kind of like was the signs that there would be a regathering of Europe over a common cur currency. When I was stationed, I lived in Germany, we had the mark. Uh, French had theirs, France had theirs, all theirs, but if you look at it now, there's the Euro dollar over a 10 nation confederacy. Go back to Daniel, you know, understand the prophecy, understand Revelation, you need to understand Daniel. So all these are examples of the signs of time that God's prophecy is nearing to the end of days. And it's pretty clear that we're not too far from the city. And the final days is history as we know it. So as most of us read, this begins with the rapture of the church. Everyone that's been accepted Jesus Christ as their sin bearer will be called up in the sky to meet the Lord. That event will trigger another event. The rapture where we'll be judged at the judgment feet of Christ by how we lived our Christian lives during the time of our salvation to our rapture through our death, whichever comes first, will trigger an event called the tribulation. So this is the event I want to talk about tonight. To me, it's the most serious event, pretty downright scary at times to me. And most of you know I don't hold back. You know, I believe everything the Bible says. You know, God says what he means, it means what he says. So I never sugarcoat anything, but if you want to turn with me, I'm going to start in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Or you can just take notes or just listen. When you're there, say amen. If you're not, say wait a minute. Carrie Ann's looking. She's in 2 Timothy. The rest of us are 2 Thessalonians. Makes, makes you feel bad when you can't find it, Carrie Ann, don't it? Makes you feel unspiritual. You're fiddling in your pocketbook. I know all those tricks. I'm just teasing you. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by the word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. That the day of Christ is at hand. So these Christians were nervous that they had missed the rapture because certain things were going on around them. <clears throat> and, they were in what, and they thought they were in what Paul called the day of Christ or some called the day of the Lord. The day of the Christ is a synonym for the tribulation. The tribulation is a seven-year period of time of the display of God's wrath on earth. It is called the day of Christ versus the day of man. You and I live in the day of man, not the day of Christ. The day of man is when God gives man the free choice to accept or reject him and face God's passive wrath. Today, you and I don't experience the active wrath of God the consequences we face today of evil, full of evil people doing bad things, evil things, is because of their bad choices. It's the consequences of our choices, not the display of God's act of wrath. I know that confused me when I wrote it and then typed it. In the Old Testament, we read about the act of wrath, fire coming down from heaven, the earth opening up, the great flood. That was the act of wrath of God when God did it directly. But the death of Jesus Christ changed that where God poured out his act of wrath on Christ on the cross. 
so he doesn't have to pour his wrath out on us now. So all the bad stuff you're seeing throughout the world isn't because of God's doing it. It's because man is choosing to do it. And in the day of man, he is giving us the privilege of making our own choices and the consequences that come with those choices. But it's not because God is making them happen. In the day of man, we choose. In the day of Christ, God chooses. So these believers were concerned that somehow they missed the rapture and things were confusing because people were telling them stuff that confused them. So Paul has to write them to clarify the issue about the day of Christ. Tyler, you're six. I'm going to need your help. You don't get to play alone. You don't always have this game. You guys thought I was going to forget it. <laughs> Come on. I'm not going to hurt you. Sword drill time. Now, this is a good one. That's the reason I waited. So in order to find this one, you're pretty much going to need to know your Bible. And I want to find out here. So, Bible's closed, up in the air. We know the drill. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 14. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 14. Go. So we just did one, but I'm going to read, if you're there, Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hath us greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So reading that, I don't know about you, but I do not want to be part of that day. This is the day that the world will see a side of God that no one living today has ever seen. And I like some of us can probably relate, probably not as well as me, but growing up, I mean, if you can just picture me as a kid or picture me in high school. Now, my dad was a nice dad. I had a good dad. But growing up, like I said, imagine me, the choices that I made. Lance, you lived through them, seen some of them. <clears throat> I'm sure my dad was thinking, yep, keep it up. Keep trying me. Just keep on trying me. So in other words, me, dad telling me to keep it up, he's going to show a side of him that I'd never seen before as a kid, and I didn't want to see, but I ended up seeing it, but... So let me describe this reason for this day. The reason for this day, there's a few of them, is so that Satan will be released to reveal his true character. And if we think the devil's bad now, let's just wait. We haven't seen bad yet because in the tribulation, the seven-year period, Satan will be released to express his fullest evil. Throughout the Bible, and Tyler's mentioned this before in sermons, you read that Satan had to ask permission from God to do things. He doesn't get to do anything unless God okays it. In the tribulation, God is going to free Satan up. Satan will be freed up to be as evil as he is. So the world will exactly see the true meaning of evil. In the tribulation, God will also reestablish his program with Israel. He told Israel that if you accept me as your Messiah... Well, they didn't, and they still haven't. But in the tribulation, God will make them. 
Matthew 23, 37 through 39, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So after dealing with us, the Gentiles, and after the rapture, God is going to reconnect with Israel because Christ cannot come back until Israel accepts him. So when the tribulation starts, God will fully show everyone how sinful sin can be. Everyone will exactly see how God feels about sin and how God's wrath will be fully displayed all on the day of the Christ. <laughs> Even a quick browsing of the book of Revelation lets you know that you don't want to be there when a third of the earth is killed overnight, another quarter dies at another time, when comets are coming down from the heaven and hitting earth. You do not want to be there when the water is turned into blood, when the sun is being blocked so that that's causing famine, when crime is released by truly evil people, when the moon turns to blood, and when God releases what he is yet to be released. And to me, here comes the scary part. The tribulation will introduce a world figure. It will, it will introduce a person unlike anyone that you've ever met. He is described to us a little bit back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day <clears throat> shall not come except there come a falling away first, that a man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself all <clears throat> that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. The world being such chaos, when you're talking about the chaos, when someone will have to rise up to the scene in order to bring this chaotic world to order. Circumstances give history to personalities. The chaos in Germany gave a rise to Adolf Hitler. The chaos in the former Soviet Union gave rise to Stalin and Lenin. So in other, worlds, other words, social disruption gives rise to a personality. The world will be so chaotic that it will be looking for someone to bring order to all this chaos. And there will be the one that rises up, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, called the lawless one. Verse 3, the son of perdition. And will establish himself, as it says in verse 4, as God. And we all know his name. It's the Antichrist. He will rise and position himself and call himself God. If the, <clears throat> so if the rapture is close, we're reading the signs, more than likely this person could already be alive and here on earth. If Jesus comes back tomorrow and the tribulation starts Friday, is that right? Yeah. Then this, this individual is already here on earth. He just hasn't been identified yet. The lawless one will be powerful. <laughs> he will not be like any other individual we've ever seen. 2 Thessalonians 9 through 11. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all the deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. So this man will be empowered by Satan they will be able to produce things that are unbelievable. So people will be like, oh, wow, did you see that? Look what just happened. Because Satan will be released to empower this man who will be put on display for the whole world to see. Don't, don't believe me? Look at technology today. No matter where he is in the world, everyone will see him. Who's not going to believe a man that's doing such wonders? Who will not follow someone who's doing miracles right in front of their face? 
who has hocus pocus down to an art form. People will be stunned and it'll be broadcasted all over Fox News, CNN, on your iPads, on your iPhones. Everyone will be talking and texting about these so-called miracles. So this is where I think it gets crazier and into my favorite book. Revelation chapter 13, I'm not going to read all of them, but verses 1 through 18 talks about the lawless one. I'm just going to read a few of them. Two, and the, beach which, and the beast which I saw was unlike unto a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So who's the dragon? Go back a little bit in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, called the devil and Satan. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon is Satan. Now watch this. And they worshiped the dragon, in verse 4, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why? Because he gave power and authority to the beast. And this confuses me, so I'm going to just bear with me. They're going to worship the devil because of the magic that the beast is doing. They're going to say that the beast must be doing everything right, so let's worship the power of the beast. And the power of the beast comes from the dragon, and the dragon is the devil. So the beast is giving praise to the dragon, and the dragon is being worshipped. So basically, during the tribulation, there's going to be devil worshipping. And verse 5, and there, was given, <clears throat> and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him, 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to un overcome them. And power was given him over the kindreds, the tribes, and the tongues, the languages, and nations to continue forty and two months. I'll come back to that. Eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the <clears throat> lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this is going to be worldwide because there's so much power coming from this man. But wait, verse 11. And I behold another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Okay, so we have another beast, so this is beast number two. So we have the dragon, Satan, and we have the beast, beast number one, which we've identified as the Antichrist. And now we're going to be in, introduced to the second beast. So chapter 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The second beast is the false prophet. And for the ones that don't know, which probably everybody here, but just in case, I've just now introduced you to the unholy trinity. Correct? Correct. Satan's purpose has always been to replicate God. Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Satan is saying that he is going to have his own trinity because I want to be like God. So Satan comes to be like God, the father. Satan gives power to the first beast, the Antichrist, the son. The second beast makes his appearance, the false prophet, the unholy trinity, Holy Spirit. So let's go back to 13, starting in 12, where the second beast comes in. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein <coughs> to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the first beast gets everyone to worship the dragon. The second beast gets everyone to worship the first beast. And if you know your Bible, of course, the Father recognizes the Son. The Son gets us to worship the Father. And the Holy Spirit gets us to worship the Son. With me? I'm not. Satan imitates the Trinity and imitates it so well that he's even able to do miracles. 
And all of this will get the world's attention. And if you look closely, I'm going to go back to this, verse 12, whose deadly wound was healed. Notice deadly, not just a wound, but a deadly wound. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but Bob, you're the doctor. But if you have a deadly wound, wouldn't that mean that you died? So if you died and you're and now you're here, you're alive. This deadly wound is referring to the first beast, the Antichrist, and Satan's unholy trinity, representing the Son. So who do we actually know that died and came back? And whose wounds are still visible? Satan is going to imitate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says the whole world will be deluded by this one. So now the whole world has the unholy trinity. Real quick, I'm going to move on real quick after this. Chapter 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Man was created on the sixth day. So there's a six for Satan. There's a six for the Antichrist. There's a six for the false prophet and the unholy trinity. Six, six, six. Verse 16. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads. Now we're obligated to the unholy trinity. So when you get, you know, the 666 is all three of them. So once again, it wouldn't surprise me if this was worldwide because believe it or not, the world has your credit card number right now. Why will everyone have to take this mark? Look at verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell save he <coughs> that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you can't go to the grocery store without the mark. Tyler, you can't shop on Amazon without the mark. So if you reject the mark, you starve. You can't do any business without the mark. And I believe it was Mike one time during a sermon that said, what are you going to do if your child's sick and you have to take him to the hospital and you don't have the mark or you're going to let your child die? It's a scary thought. So he's going to control the whole world. One world government, one world religion, one world economic order. And believe it or not, if we're paying attention to the signs, this is already starting to try to take over now. I'm not going to go all these. I had some notes in here for Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27, if you guys want to go back. But the Antichrist will make a covenant seven years with Israel. He is going to solve and give peace to the Middle East. So Syria, Israel, Iran, Iraq, all the chaos over there, just like the Bible predicted, the lawlessness will step in and come out with a peace agreement. Everyone is going to say, the world is great again. Peace in the Middle East. Look, all our problems are gone. But during the middle of this tribulation, the 42 weeks, the Antichrist is going to turn. Go to the temple and say, I am God, and all hell is going to break loose. Read on in the book of Revelation, the seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, the bowl judgment, the vials, etc. So he's going to start off the tribulation with a Middle East peace treaty. So if you're here, I don't plan on being here. That's what I was telling Tyler Erder. I don't want to be here for his peace in the Middle East. That means I missed something. Let him keep fighting. So if you're here and you see that the peace treaty is signed by this guy, you miss the rapture, and you're in the tribulation. You see all these people in the past that tried to get that peace treaty signed and it didn't last? There's a reason. They weren't him, and it wasn't time yet. I never want to see peace in the Middle East because if I do, that means I miss the rapture, and I want raptured out. I do not want to be around during this time. Remember when God rained down his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah? He lifted Lot out. Before, the flood, before he flooded the whole earth, he lifted Noah and his family out. He raptured them out so they wouldn't be subject to his wrath. 
Everyone that has accepted Jesus Christ will be raptured out, so they will not be subject to the day of God's act of wrath. So time for the nitty-gritty now. Throughout this whole message, you've been sitting there thinking, wait then, you said if I accepted Jesus Christ, I'd be raptured out. That is correct. That means I'm not going to be here for the tribulation. That is correct. So with Tyler Coffin, what in the world does this sermon have to do with me? Good question. I'm going to tell you. Even though it's not part of our destiny, and if you're a Christian here, when you reject Christ, you open yourself up for satanic deception. Even if we're a Christian, you and I, let me say that again, even if we're a Christian, Satan has influence in our lives. When we reject Christ's authority over our lives, we have just now opened the door for Satan. I know you're thinking, wait, I thought that happened in the tribulation. That is correct, but it's being practiced now. If you want to go with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try these spirits where they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into this world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses <clears throat> that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that the spirit of the Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already in this world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. So the Antichrist is yet to come, but the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. So the illusion spirit is here, and we all have the potential to be duped by the devil. Basically saying if Jesus Christ is not central in our life choices and decision making, we don't have to say devil fool me. We've already, <clears throat> all we have to do is not be committed to Jesus Christ and we've already been duped, been fooled. And that's why so many people today are fooled by TV shows, by movies, talk show hosts, people who sound good, people who look good. People get duped because they do not take seriously their own confession of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is not confessed, the devil has an open door to our life choices and decision making, which leads me to only committed Christians can overcome the devil. I'll say it again. Only committed Christians can overcome the devil. A lot of people are Christians, but they haven't overcome Satan's influence in their lives because they haven't made that decision of commitment yet. Overcome, Revelation 12, 11. If you want to turn there with me, or PJ, if you can put it up. I always forget this is there. That's so much easier to read. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. So if you read that, there's three parts, correct? A couple ands in there. So the blood of the lamb, that's the easy part, right? But don't stop reading. John says there are three things needed to overcome the devil. The blood of the lamb, we've accepted Jesus Christ. Two, they overcome the devil with the word of their testimony, which means the word of your testimony is your public declaration of your association with Jesus Christ. So if you're a secret agent Christian, if you're a spiritual CIA agent, if you're a covert Christian operative, guess what? You will not defeat the devil. So here's something to think about. The devil, devil doesn't care if you talk about God. There's too many gods out there. That's, that's generic. There's so many out there. Your testimony and association with Jesus Christ is what the devil can't handle. So if you're ashamed of Jesus Christ, you can talk all day about God this and God that because you're being non, very nonspecific. But when you declare Jesus Christ, the devil can't handle the blood. You cannot be a silent Christian. 
Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if we remember back election or any time there's elections or this or that, we have no time or no problem talking about our candidates. We'll put signs up in our yard, we'll wear T-shirts, bumper stickers on our cars. <clears throat> then why can't we establish ourselves as a follower of Jesus Christ like that? You know, the son of the living God. Here's the hard one for me. John says, number three, love their life. God wants you to love him more than you love you. And we love us some us. I love me some me. But I'm not cocky. Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's why he says we, you know, we cannot be his disciple. So if I'm going to love him more than I love me, Tyler, you should know that Mariah is going to love him more than she loves you, and vice versa. So you cannot defeat the devil without commitment. That's why so many believers live in defeat, because they're saved, but what they want in their life, and <clears throat> what they want is their way of heaven, because they don't have commitment. They have religion, they have church, but they don't have commitment. So I don't know about you, but I know personally I need to get committed a lot stronger than I am now. There's a couple of them I struggle with daily. And finally, we should be willing to be a witness. We all, we all have relatives, friends, co-workers. I know school's out, but fellow students, high school, elementary, college, who are headed towards that day. And they need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to be asked, do you know where you're spending eternity? I want to close before I give it you, real quick before I give it to Tyler or Gary, whoever wants to do the altar call. But in closing, I'm sure a bunch of us have flown on an airplane. I have flown on, not you, Connie? Okay, just play along. I've, I've flown on, on a few. But when I flew, and I'm sure like any others, Shelly left, but I'm sure we all had a confirmed seat on our ticket. So when I get my boarding pass, it had a number on it that had my seat on it. Ben doesn't travel standby. Standby means I'm not confirmed. Standby means I hope I make it. Standby means I hope there's room for me on this flight. So when you go to people today and ask them where they're going to spend eternity and they say they hope they make it to heaven, then they're flying standby. I want a confirmed seat. Don't try to go to heaven on standby or you'll wait too long and there won't be any seats left. <clears throat>